Good evening, everybody. And welcome to this presentation. I want to thank Father Hung, Pham, for um, inviting me to do this. It's been a while since I've uh, preached a retreat. It's been five years or so since I've stood before an audience. Uh, but I all have always enjoyed doing it. Um, and so tonight we're going to look at um, the examine, which is how we pronounce it in the southern part of the province, uh, the examine um, and how it relates to the, uh, to the whole notion of conversion. You know, we live in an age today when people spend a great deal of time cultivating that outside personality, the outside way that people look at us, right? By the number of friends you have on Facebook and how many likes you get and so forth. We spend a great deal of time doing that. Now, I have nothing against that. I won't do it, but I'm just saying that, you know, we live in a culture where that is um, more the norm than it was before there was social media. However, Ignatius um, had to deal with some of the same sort of things, that pride, that idea that, you know, he wanted to do certain things that would bring him recognition, that would bring him a financial security, that would bring him a beautiful wife and all those things. So Ignatius did have, um, you know, his own desires, much like the desires we have today. We're not really that different from him. Um, but tonight and this uh, year, we're celebrating uh, what we call Ignatius's conversion. Uh, that is, we're celebrating uh, May 20th, or I think it was May 20th, May of 2021, when we say that Ignatian had his conversion. But actually, that was only the beginning of his conversion. So let's not say that, you know, conversion is going to happen overnight. It doesn't. It happens over a lifetime. And so Ignatius, then, what we're celebrating is the beginning of a turnaround for him. Now, what really happens in conversion? Well, um, uh, one of my uh, teachers at uh, JTS, JSTB, when we were studying theology, uh, was a, um, a Franciscan uh, father named uh, Kenan Osborne. Great, great guy. And um, in one of his books, he talks about religious experience. And he says, a religious experience is where God breaks into our lives in a certain way, and it demands a response. So every religious experience that we have demands a response. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if somebody gave you a great gift, what would you say? Thank you, right? So you would want to do something. The lady who lives next door to me, you know, she gave us cookies for Christmas, so I made her bread pudding, and no, she's going to come back and give me something else. And that's what happens when you have this kind of loving relationship. Um, so Ignatius um, had to sort of learn uh, how conversion works. So, you know, God woke him up with a cannonball. I'm not saying God woke him up with a cannonball. The cannonball woke him up, and then he was laid out in a bed for quite a long time. You know that. And so it was only in thinking about his life and all the things that he wanted to go back to, that's soldiering and sword fighting and chasing beautiful girls and all that stuff, that he began to think about that. And that was his, that's what his life was about, right? Except that God reached down and said, Ignatius, well, I'm not sure what God said, but I think that God said something like, Ignatius, how about if you look at your life in a different way? How about if you just change your perspective of what your life should be about? That's what happens to us when we join the Society of Jesus. It's the invitation from God that says, why don't you think about your life in a different way? And so we go about our lives and we understand that there should be some change. Jesus calls it change of heart. We call it conversion. I think it's the same thing. What Jesus says, and he does, says it a lot, if you look in the scriptures, change of heart, the hardness of your heart, 
all those things he talks about, he talks about the heart a great deal. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about this conversion of St. Ignatius. It's a change in his heart. It's a change in the way he looks at the world. And as Ignatius began to look at that, and God continued to give him the grace to look at that, and Ignatius participated more and more in that grace, his life began to change more and more. So if we look at conversion, it's always God reaching down into our lives and offering us something that we hadn't had before, that we hadn't seen before, something new. And it demands a response from us. Um, so for Ignatius, it was, well, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep thinking about what it would be like if I followed in the footsteps of St. Francis or St. You know, Bonaventure or whoever he was going to follow in the footsteps of. I'll continue to do that. And eventually what happens is because Ignatius participated in the great gift that God was giving him, that he began, some very serious things began to happen in his life. Okay. Well, I want to go to the whole notion of washing the inside of the cup. When Jesus says, oh, you Pharisees, you're great at cleaning the outside of the cup, but you never wash the inside of the cup. What is he getting at? I think he's getting at the very same thing that we're talking about right now, that we love what's on the exterior, right? We love for people to like us. We love for people to admire us. Why do we spend so much time on beautiful clothes? Why do we spend so much time on makeup? Why do we spend so much money on the things that are externals? Because we like people to look at us, admire us, and it makes us feel good. Okay, so God is saying, I don't really care about that. I don't care about your looks. I don't care how beautiful you are or how unbeautiful you are or how fat or skinny or male or female or black or white or any of that. I don't care about that. What I care about is the inside. Wash the inside of yourself. That way, once that happens and the inside is clean, then the outside, it really doesn't matter because if you truly wash the inside of your cup, that's going to show itself on the outside. I don't know how many of you have what I call an Aunt Sally. Aunt Sally is the kind of person in your life who always is the same. You can go to her and she will help you in any way that she can. She will give you good advice. She'll give you the shirt off her back. She'll help you in any way that she's the kind of person that's the same on the inside and the outside. She may not look like much, but what you see, what you get is what's inside. And I think what God would like for us to do, and the lesson from St. Ignatius sort of indicates this, what God would like from us is for us to be so much like what's on the inside, on the outside. And the inside to be so much like Jesus Christ that there isn't going to be a question about what's, on, what's going to be on the outside. So this whole notion of Ignatius's, um, of Ignatius's conversion is really a big lesson for us. It is God saying to us, look, Think about all the possibilities in your life. All the possibilities to do good. All the possibilities for change. Now, God's going to continue to give us those little ideas and the grace to go with them. The problem is most of us don't take advantage of the grace. It's called participatory grace. And I don't want to get into a philosophical discussion about participatory grace because it could go on and on and on. But when we participate, it's like when Thomas Aquinas says, we have to play ball with God. You know, God's going to give us these possibilities. He's going to give us 
these graces. And those graces are meant to change us if we play ball. What does it mean to play ball? Well, it means to let go of all the stuff that's holding you back, whatever that stuff might be. Now, it's very easy for me to talk about it. It is so hard to do. And I have tried, and I continue to try every day, to look at the graces that God is giving me and to say, okay, God, I know that you would like for me to do this. I cannot do it on my own. And that is the secret to conversion. The secret to conversion, the secret to washing the inside of the cup is to admit to God that we can't do it. That's the first step. The second step is to say to the Lord, but you can. And the third step is to say, I surrender. That is the hardest part. The I surrender part. You know, if those of you who give the spiritual exercises, who have worked through the spiritual exercises, know that in the annotations, Ignatius says that we do spiritual exercises to rid ourselves of all the disordered affections, all the disordered desires that we have. And in that way, to get closer to God. So those disordered desires might be for money, might be for to have a slim you know, body. It might be to have the nicest car. It might be to have the biggest house. Those are disordered desires. Our real desires that God would like for us to have are to leave all of those things behind and to say, Lord, I want what you want to give. I want the gift of holiness. And that's really what Ignatius is is seeking in his conversion. It's holiness. It's becoming something different than he was. And Ignatius can't do it on his own. It's just impossible. But the Holy Spirit can do anything. When I talk to people about this very thing, you know, people come afterwards and say to me, Father, I, I, I can't do that. You know, I can't not hate people. I can't not be prejudiced against those people. Or I can't want poverty over wealth. Those things that, you know, we normally are very hard to get rid of. They're very hard. To, they're, like, they're like things that you have to uproot. They're weeds in our spiritual lives. And people come to me and say, Father, I, I can't do that. And I say, yes, you can. You may not want to do it. There's a big difference. I don't want to do this, and I can't do this. Because if you don't want to do it, no matter how hard God's going to try, it will not happen. God will never force us into conversion. He will never do that because God is not a God of coercion. God is a God that says, look, here's something I would like for you to pay attention to. Here's something that could help you. Here's something that could make your life worthwhile. And I then, my response has to be, okay, I'll take a look. I'll try it. But if I say, eh, I'm okay. Thanks, but I'm all right. God's not going to force you. So if you truly are interested in conversion, and washing the inside of your cup. That is, washing the inside of your cup is to change your heart. It's to let yourself have a change of heart, to become something that you are not today. And that's really what our journey is, isn't it? We're all in that pilgrimage. We're all trying to get to be better than we are today. I'm not going to make it tomorrow. I'm not going to be holy next year unless I die and God lifts me up into heaven, it's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong work that we have to become involved in. And so what I'm inviting you to, to do is to think about your life. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just stop for a moment. 
And I'd like for you to think, maybe close your eyes, sit back and take a deep breath, close your eyes and think about something that happened today in your life that might be the stumbling block. Did you say something unkind to somebody? Did you kick the dog? Did you yell at your secretary? I don't know. But think about your life today just for a moment and think, what is it that you would like God to change for you? And are you willing to give that up? Okay, let's just come back here to the chapel. This is what we do with the examine. And the examine is what keeps us on task. It keeps us looking at ourselves every day and saying, what's the problem? Why am I resisting the movement that God is inviting me to? God is giving me this grace, and I'm fighting against it. The examine means that we look at ourselves and we say, why am I fighting it? And the examine is a way for us to look at the ulterior motives. We go deeper into the no to figure out what's the reason I'm saying no. And I can promise you that you're going to find Fear is the reason, or you're, for some reason, you're afraid that people are going to not like the new you, that you're not going to be able to do it. There are a number of ways in which fear will play out. But what you have to do in the examine is to at least recognize what the problem is. And once you recognize what the problem is, what's the holdback, what's the obstacle, then you can begin to work on it. But if you go through your life and nothing ever changes, that is, nothing spiritually ever changes, you go to church on Sunday and you, you know, say your rosary and you do all those things that you're supposed to do as a good Catholic. Okay, those are all good things. But Jesus didn't talk about that. Jesus talked about a change of heart. He talked about washing the inside of the cup, becoming something new. And that's really what our spiritual journeys ought to be about, becoming something new. What we desire has to be what God desires. That's the only way for this to work. As long as my desire is a disordered desire or is not what God would desire for me, then I'm not going to be able to reach that goal that I'm looking for. Ignatius spent a whole lifetime doing this. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, yes, we celebrate that on, in May and you know, whatever the date was, but that was only the day that he suddenly realized, ah, God is offering me something different here. And he began to explore that little by little by little. And he says in his autobiography that God spoon fed him. It's like, it's like feeding a baby little by little. And that's what happens with us. When God offers us things, we then, does that mean that I'm, my time is up? I heard a, a buzzer of some kind. Anyway, that's how God deals with us. He gives us little bits of help. Just enough for us. It's like, it's like throwing a line out into the water, you know. You want the fish to get hooked. And you don't have to put a big chunk of meat down there. You got to put a little worm. And that's really what God is trying to do. He's trying to hook us into doing what is good. And so when God gives you graces in your examine, 
And you come through your exam and you say, aha, this might be what God is asking me to do. When God gives you that grace, you have to begin to work on it. You have to begin to say, yes, Lord, I want to do that. And God might ask you to give up. Now, I'm not saying that any of you are like this, but to give up your sense of prejudice, your sense that you are better than somebody else. Your sense that I should hate somebody because they don't think like I do. A lot of people live their lives that way today. And I think what God is saying is that cannot be the so with you. It has to be different. So as we begin to look at our own lives, at our conversions, and what happened with Ignatius, we see how important the exam is on a daily, on a daily basis that feeds into that that sense of where we're going, that feeds us, that feeds into our spiritual journey into holiness.